Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live and taking some questions, giving some answers. Um, today is a Tuesday CSS critique, but we also have some treading critiques we're going to do, um, as well as talk about something that a lot of people neglect. Not only do they neglect practicing treading, but they neglect actually practicing any mobility that can aid you in treading. In fact, I've seen people go from unable to do anything of an effective egg beater kick to actually producing an egg beater kick where they can tread holding a weight, you know, with no hands uh, in about a month of just practicing a little bit of treading, a little bit of stretching. So uh, there are some poses that you can practice that can definitely help you with your treading. One of them is right out of yoga, uh, practicing the frog pose. But then don't do it on all fours. Try to do it sitting up and vertical and take your butt as close to your heels as you can. And that, my friend, is a position that you should be able to get into to produce an effective breaststroke kick or an effective egg beater. Because if you think about it, an egg beater is nothing more than an alternating breaststroke kick, where a lot of people screw that up as they're pushing water with the bottom of their feet or pushing water with the top of their feet, you know, kicking down, which is what you want to do. But when you're doing an egg beater, you're actually kicking water with the inside of your shin and the inside of your foot, very similar to the way you would kick a soccer ball going down. So imagine kicking a soccer ball down to the bottom of the pool, right? That's going to produce a downward force, so you go up. That's the key to treading, whether you're using a scissor kick with fins, without fins, an egg beater, a breaststroke, doesn't really matter. The physics is the same. You have to push down so you go up. And a lot of people think the egg beater is a spinning of the legs like this, like an egg beater. If that's, case, if that's the case, the egg beater is poorly named because that's not what you do. You actually spin like this. It's just alternating, right? So you're pushing down so you go up. So that is how you do the egg beater. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of videos, and then I'm going to share with you a YouTube channel that I would highly recommend watching. In fact, I will type it in right now, egg beater for beginners. And usually his, yep, pops right up. It's awesome. Um, this guy's really good. He must be a water polo player. So here's the deal. If you want to learn how to do an egg beater, watch water polo players do their thing because they, they're the pros, right? Um, all right. So let's, let's take some questions and I'll start showing some videos here real quick. So is the tread test in buds five or 10 minutes with no hands? Um, it's a good question. I think there may be a five and a 10 minute. You know, I have to double check on that one. Regardless, I even if you don't know that answer, my, my answer is you should be able to tread for 10 minutes with no hands, period, right? Don't worry what the test is. If you can do it for 10 minutes, you got it controlled. Um, I think maybe without fins, it's a five minute tread with fins and weight and weight belt and dive tanks. It's 10 minutes. But I could be wrong. Um, I'll double check. I'd be five. But regardless, if you practice for 10, you're good to go. In fact, all of our swim workouts that we do, whether it's an upper body day or a lower body day, and there's a difference in when we do swims. On lower body days, we swim with fins. On upper body days, we don't. 
all of our swim workouts are um, are focused with a 10 minute warm up tread or a 10 minute cool down tread. So you have a choice. You can swim for 10 minutes for your warm up or you can tread for 10 minutes for your warm up. Or you can swim for 10 minutes for your warm up or you can tread for 10 minutes with your warm up. My suggestion would be whatever you're weak at doing, do one or the other. So for instance, if I'm working with somebody and we're getting better at swimming and now they're crushing the CSS and 830, you know, you don't really need to practice a 500 yard swim if you can crush an 830 pretty easily. So instead of swimming for 10 minutes, start treading for 10 minutes as your warm up. because I will promise you, you're swimming with no hands. That that is basically vertical swimming. So it's a great way to do it. So if you even notice in the uh, in the 50 50 workout, like there's usually a 500 yard swim workout or like a warm up or a 10 minute tread. It's up to you, whichever one you need to do. Um, so, yeah, there's the answer. Unfortunately, you know, I am not the source of all answers when it comes to the time and distances of all fitness tests in the military. My suggestion would be if it's five minutes, do it for 10 minutes. But I do know it's not longer than 10 minutes. Things that say drug facts are forbidden at buds. What is yes, not drug facts. Supplement facts. We mentioned that yesterday. Now, if it says nutrition facts, that's a different story. And I wish I would have brought that down. I have some. Uh, let me see. In fact, I wrote an article on it. Nutrition facts supplement facts to Smith. Amazing what that Google machine will spit out. <laughs> right? In fact, yeah, the ascent protein. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't take a picture. I thought I was going to take a picture of nutrition facts on there, but pretty much, you know, if you look at um, the ascent protein website, ascentprotein.com, you can see read what it's all about, and it's it's pure protein. Yep. So it is considered a food. So that's the deal. I don't know anything about drug facts, Joe. I don't take drugs. You know? Do they even have drug facts on the back of bottles? You know, maybe a prescription. But if you get prescribed it from a doctor, like you got strep throat or something. Well, I don't know, Joe. <laughs> You know, what's it matter? Don't take anything. I think you can take Motrin if you're prescribed it from the doctor. Because they, you know, what what does the military give you? Motrin all the time. So Motrin, Tylenol, yeah. If you need to take something for that, I don't think that is an issue. <sighs> There you go. So ibuprofen says drug facts on the bottom. There you go. You know, it's never been an issue. So one of that question is just like, I don't know, Joe. I took Motrin when I was going through buds. But I was also given it, given it to me by the uh, corpsman at buds. So it, it was medically prescribed. So there you go. But yeah, don't do drugs. So I hope that I hope that makes your day, Joe. We figured out something for you. All right, let's do this. Let's change the uh, topic quick. That was one of those questions that I don't really think matters. All right, so let's do this. 
So you guys should be able to see this. Right? Guys treading. So let's take a look at it. All right, so what do you guys see here? You guys, notice how he's kicking. He gets his knee up pretty well, but notice when he's pushing down, what is he doing? He's not really pushing down like he's trying to kick a soccer ball to the bottom of the pool, right? He's actually kicking with the bottom of his feet and even with his left foot with the top of his feet. So this... Believe it or not, is not the egg beater. And notice he has to use his hands in order to keep treading because he can't uh, can't stay up without using his hands. So now if you, you can see, he's kind of using, he's, he's almost got it. Like his, le his right foot is pushing down with the inside of his foot like he's supposed to. But notice the, the right foot. The right foot's like pushing down like he's got a fin on, right? And he's kicking with the top of his foot. And pretty much not think about these force vectors, right? These force vectors are going diagonal at best. Like if you can see my cursor, like the force vector, he, he's kicking water towards the wall, kicking water down a little bit here, but not vertical. So what you want to do is be able to change the direction of the ankles. Got to get the ankles higher and you have to be able to push down with a significant amount of force so you are able to tread water, All right? So the guy that I like here, um, let me share, let me share the screen. The guy I like here is, um, let me see if I can find it, Chrome tab, egg beater, Google search, look at that. So what I did is I Googled Egg beater beginners, right? And this guy comes up, how to be egg beater tread water for beginners. And he does a really good job of showing how to do this. Like you see that right there? See how high he gets his ankles? He is, he's, uh, it's kind of looks a little, little awkward there, but he's working on his mobility. But you can see if it, those damn things are out of the way. See how he's, getting his ankles up a little higher, pushing down. So he goes up. Yeah. So anyway, check this guy out because he talks significantly about the egg beater. Then there's other guys, as you can see here, the egg beater kick stretches and common mistakes. Good stuff. Kick with dry land exercises. And you, it'll show you like he's trying to kick a soccer ball to the bottom of the pool. So I would highly recommend watching some people who are professionals at doing the egg beater and learning how to do the egg beater. But you may find like that guy that I just showed, he needs to work on his mobility because um, it's just not enough to um, get you into the proper egg beater position. In fact, I'll show you something. In fact, I put a link in the, um, in fact, I'll put a link in the uh, videos here. I'm sorry, in the comment section. But I put it in the description of this video and it's got some pretty good stretches in here that are going to help you with doing the egg beater. These are the ones that I do, and they are very helpful. So you guys can see this, right? So um, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. All right, so that's a little big. All right, so we got, this is basically a vertical frog pose. Now you can't really see it from here, but my ankles are on the floor. You can see it here a little bit better. See, my ankles are on the floor. My butt is about ankle high. Uh, not quite on the floor. I don't recommend going on the floor, but you should be pretty close. I think my pants are a little baggy, so it doesn't look like, it looks like I'm sitting on the floor. I am not. Um, but as you can see, both ankles need to be pushing down like this. And you, if you can get your shin to a point where it's almost parallel to the ground or parallel to the 
uh, surface of the water, that's just that much more space that you're going to be able to use to push down vertically so you go up. And these are just some other typical hip stretches that work really well for loosening the hips, loosening the inner outer thighs, um, you know, doing the standard, you know, front leg out, pigeon pose, you know, some more stretches here. Now these right here, see the ankles here in like this hyper stretched position. That is basically from swimming with fins. So there's another ankle mobility position that needs to occur if you want to be able to swim with fins without a lot of pain. So those are some really good stretches that you can use to uh, help you get into a better treading position. So I hope that makes sense for you. All right, so other questions. All right, so don't see any other questions right now. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk about prior to this was pretty much this article here. If you guys go check out uh, that article I just put in the uh, description, it's called Swimming the CSS and treading water step-by-step -step breakdown. And it this is a great video. It's a YouTube video, pretty old, but this guy's a non-swimming athlete that really crushes the CSS. And I break it down with the top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. There's some other videos in here that you can really watch the top arm pull and get that good freestyle catch. And these are, these are videos of people who are much better at swimming than I am and just you can break, you can pull pieces of their ability to swim and apply it to the CSS and just make you that much better. And then these are just some skills that I've recently just acquired in my coaching to help people with treading. Because I was having a hard time coaching people with treading, but I, I realized that the people were understanding what I was saying with treading. They just weren't physically able to get into a proper treading position because they had tight ankles, knees, and hips. So our treading workouts literally were stretching workouts with a little bit of treading involved. And next thing you know, three or four weeks later, they are now crushing treading. So if you're having problems with egg beater and you're having problems with treading, Take a look at your mobility and see what's going on. I'm going to do uh, probably a post tomorrow um, with our, we have mobility day tomorrow, and I'm just going to go through all the stretches that I like to use just for treading and swimming. So there's basically three things that you, you really have to work on. You have to work on your streamline body position, which means your arms over your head, Right. By the way, I just got through uh, working out and I didn't even shower. So still in my workout clothes. Um, so arms over your head, you know, like a rocket or like a torpedo. Right. And um, then uh, ankle mobility for swimming with fins. That is a must. If you've never swum with fins before and you put on fins for the first time. You will see that sucks. Um, it just hurts, right? Because your ankles are stiff. Uh, there's a couple of poses that you can test to see if your ankles are there. One of them's the one that you just saw there. If you can see daylight on top of your foot and your ankle connection, then your ankles are stiff when you're sitting in that position. Um, if you can't see daylight, then your ankles are pretty mobile. And now you just got to get your ankles used to swimming with fence. Um, and the other one is, you know, knees, hips, and ankles just to be able to tread better. So I know we're talking a lot about treading, but it is really important. You know, unfortunately, I see a lot of people fail or get rolled or kicked out for treading. And if it's in a prep course, like dive prep, 
they're done. I mean, they they won't go to dive school. So a lot of people's spec ops dreams end at prep with the tread test. So blow it off at your own peril. So how much do guys swim with fins per week? Well, myself and my guys included, we swim on leg days. So usually it's at least two days a week swimming with fins. Sometimes, not every week, we'll do a third swim with fins where it's just cardio. So it'd be what I call like my spec ops triathlon where we'll run a little, swim, uh, ruck a little, and swim a little with fins. Um, and it's usually not too much. It's usually two or three mile run, two or three mile ruck, and then a thousand to 2000 meter swim with fins. But on our leg days, we will at least get 2000 meter with fins, sometimes three, sometimes four as they're getting ready to get to buds. Um, so I would say if you put it all together on an average week where we just do two fin swims a week, we're probably at that three to 4,000 yard range. All right. Now that's progression up. We may only start with 500 to a thousand max per swim workout. So you're only going to get a thousand to 2000 yards per swim in a week, but you definitely want to progress with your mileage uh, or yardage um whenever you're swimming with fins because you you'll 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 know why because once you start swimming your feet are just going to start hurting yeah if you're just getting into it you know what exactly what i'm saying y your ankles are going to hurt right now i will say this if you if you feel like you start bicycling just take your fins off because the reason why you're bicycling is probably because your ankles hurt and you're actually starting to swim poorly. Um, your, your legs can bend a little, but you don't want them bicycling to move. You actually want to move from your hips, right, with a slight bend in your knee when you go back and forward um, and doing like mid-size flutter kicks. Um, that's going to be better for you. I might have, I, I know I have some swim videos. If you go to my TikTok page, in fact, go to TikTok, Stu Smith 50, right? If you go to that uh, TikTok page, you will see some really good CSS swims with fins on there. Also, Stu Smith 50 on Instagram, the reels, you'll definitely see some good um, CSS with fins as well that might be able to help you see what see what I'm talking about. Got the free book. Nice. Yep. I was able to sign it and put never quit in there. That's fun for me too. I enjoy doing that. I was going to ask you how you recommend progressing swimming with fins for a new swim. Well, there you go. I think I just answered that, right? Yeah, calf cramps happen as well. But that usually is because you're over flexing your feet and not relaxing and letting the fin stretch your foot. You're like pushing it hard to be in that like um, extended position, which it's like doing a heel raise. And you're going to tighten your calves when you do that. So try to relax your ankles and just let them move through the water and let the, the power of your hips move your ankles back and forth versus you feeling like you have to like flex the calves to be able to do that, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, calves, calves usually, are, calf cramps usually occur when you're flexing your ankle too much. So try to relax it. See how that feels on you. In general, I'm targeting Army SF, but figures swimming would be a good form of cardio. Absolutely. And let me tell you, they have a great combat swimmer course, which is not easy. Um, in fact, a lot of, uh, a lot of my guys have gone on to do that because we do a lot of swimming here. So they get exposed to 
some swimming, um, regardless of you know what service they want to do. So they already know the CSS when they go in. They swim with fins. They, we do drown proofing and underwater stuff. So they have a really good advantage going into the army compared to most army prep courses. It's just it's just part of our training, and it's a good way to. I, I personally like swimming at the end of a workout just to kind of get the uh, um, effects of that workout tamping down a little bit. So, for instance, when it's a leg day and we go in and we swim with fins, you know, it, and tread water, it, it's a good way to loosen the hips up after running and rucking and doing a lot of squats or deadlifts or things like that, and then go in the swim and kind of loosen you up. So that 10 minute tread is a really good way to warm up after a leg day when you're jumping in the pool, or you can do it as a cool down. Something I like to do at the end of the swim workout is all the dynamic stretches that I can think of in chest deep water uh, for about five to 10 minutes. So I'm doing leg swing, side to side, front, back, butt kickers, jogging in place, high knees, you know, just all those little things in chest deep water. And it, makes a huge difference on you know just working out some of that leg day experience you know especially for my 53 year old legs and hips looking for dry land workouts for improving oh uncomfortable side of the css um yeah, you got a strong and weak side. My recommendation is this. Don't even practice your weak side until you've mastered the strong side. Because where a lot of people screw up is it kind of delays their progression if they're working weak and strong, weak and strong from the beginning. Let's master the strong side first, the one that feels most comfortable. Then it's a lot easier to mirror image that strong side on the weak side versus trying to learn both at the same time because it just throws you off it'd be like me taking a six-year-old and say all right you're gonna throw baseball with me you're gonna throw with your left hand you know on the odd sets and you're gonna throw with your right hand on the even sets and i'm teaching them how to throw you know so it's just yeah just master one side first and then we can worry about being ambidextrous you know you know, a few weeks, maybe a month or two later. But I can't think of any dry land stuff that's going to really help you other than just flutter kicks, planking, um, you know, things that you're already doing probably, right? Um, my suggestion, if you want to get better at swimming, you need to be swimming. You need to get in the water, get comfortable in the water, you know, and that just takes time in the water. So there you go. Even if it's just 30 minutes. Makes sense about the ankles. I'm very stiff in the water. Going to try your tread mobility workouts. Oh, yeah, man, they work. Like I said, I'll, I'll probably do some filming tomorrow on just like the most important treading uh, stretches that you need to do. But here's the deal. You not only need to be able to do the mobility exercises and the flexibility exercises of those stretching poses right because you need to be able to get into that position you know so you can be more effective with downward force production but you don't have the floor pushing up when you're in the water so now you have to work those opposing muscle groups that are usually outside the hips uh but um, you know, outer thigh type movements, um, along with that mobility. So you can now get yourself into that proper treading position without having to rely on the floor to push you up. Now there's nothing wrong with stretching on the floor, but then eventually you got to work those muscles so you can get there yourself without, without the floor. Right. Otherwise, you know, you're you're not really effectively working the, the treading muscles that are opposing the flexibility and mobility issues that you're having. 
Does that make sense? All right, so let's do, I think I have a swim with fins guy in here. Let's see if I can find him. Oh, let me, uh, before I share it, I need to find it first. <clears throat> Had that first one pulled up. Let me pull these. I just downloaded five of them. All right, so let's do a swim with fins guy. So, all right, it's pretty decent uh, footage here. All right, so what I see here is a little bit too much knee bending. Right. This is I think this is his first time swimming with those big rocket fins. And that's what's going to happen. Your knees are going to get bent a little bit because your ankle mobility is, is kind of hurting. So I wouldn't call this bicycling too much. But the problem is, you notice, like these are really small kicks. Right. And it looks like he's like kicking. Like with the top leg just a little bit and with the bottom leg just a little bit, he could definitely open up his hips a little more, get a little bit bigger. And he could also, you know, th there's also a backside to that top kick as well. Like he's just keeping it in the front of his body where he could actually go past the center line in the like do a sweeping motion as well. Um, in fact, let me show you. Let me just share. Let me share. Did you guys see that? Oh, damn it. Couldn't see the video. I'm sorry. Ah, hate it when I do that. Sorry. I had it pulled up, but I didn't have it shared. All right. So everything I just said. <laughs> I'm going to pull this up. Share a window. There you go. Damn it. What the hell is this? Sorry. Having some uh, issues here. All right. Present. Window. Share this guy. There you go. All right. So you can kind of see here what I was talking about. His kicks need to be bigger. Right? Let me see where that video is. Ah. All my videos are uh, getting jumbled up into one. Here we go. Damn it. All right. I'm not sure what's going on here. All right. Let me do this. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Where is my video? Well, this is just weird. All right. Whew. Damn. All right. So you can see he needs to kick bigger. Um, also, notice his arms when he recovers. Like, they're way out there in front of him. If he was turning this way, you'd really see him a little better. But, like, he's pulling his arms. He's got good timing. Like, usually I try to get in this glide position and kick three times. But his kicks could just be a lot bigger. You know, he's new to swimming. That happens. And as he gets a little stronger, a little more comfortable with his um, uh, kick and ankle mobility, he'll be able to put a little bit bigger uh, uh, time in there. So sorry about the uh, screen issues. Um, <sighs> brain farted that one. Um, let me see. So let me show you this because I want to show you a really good one as well. Um, let me see where this is. CSS with fins. I think this was a good one. All right. So here we go. Let's uh, share my screen. Chrome tab. Boom. This is right on my TikTok page. So what I liked about this one is he's got a little bit bigger kicks. And you notice how the top leg's going a little bit further back now than the other guys. So he's just opening up the power kick a little bit. Now he's doing a little bit of what's called a, a scissor kick with little dolph, uh, flutter kicks in between. Nothing wrong with that. I personally, I like to do both. So I like to do constant flutter kicks for a majority of the swim, especially if I'm going into current. But if I'm going with the current, 
I'm going to throw some gliding phases in there, which is just a scissor kick and hold the glide, just like you would with a normal, um, just like you would with a normal CSS without fins. So imagine this, if you just, if you're going with the current and you're don't have to do a whole lot of work, just add a big scissor kick, hold the glide. You don't even have to do these extra flutter kicks. You're just moving with the current. Now, if you're coming back, you can't do that because you probably go backwards, right? If it's depending on the speed of the current. So you may have to power through that current with a bunch of extra little flutter kicks. So there's some strategy to swimming with fins as well. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it it's good to learn multiple methods of swimming with fins. You know, some people like doing dolphin kicks, you know, just while they're, while they're doing it instead of uh, scissor kicks or flutter kicks. You know, whatever floats your boat on that one. So let me... Uh, Some reason my uh, my Windows is jacked up. I think that's been what I'm having my problem. Like I can't close out certain items on my computer. So anyway, I may not be able to share any more screen time here. That sucks. Oh well. Take some questions though, if you got them. Maybe it'll catch up here in a minute. But right now I can't I can't share anything. Um, something's a little goofy. So you got any more questions for me? I still got a little more time if you got them. It doesn't have to be about swimming. It can be about anything if you got them. So Achilles flare up, non-impact cardio until it's good question mark well it depends how you got it right typically those flare-ups are either a traumatic issue like sprinting or jumping which if you think about what those are it's a it's a stretch there you go computer just caught up wow that's weird um now it's all black <sighs> hope you guys aren't uh, experiencing any weirdness going on because my second screen just reset. So I don't even know if I'm still live. I guess I am. Um, so here's the deal. Probably caused some form of ultra or hyper stretch of the Achilles that is causing you some pain. Unless it's like somebody hit it. It's a traumatic injury where you bumped it or bruised it or something like that there are typically stretching injuries from sprinting up a hill or doing box jumps or sprinting periods sometimes people burn you know blow an achilles change in direction you know stopping and going really fast so um my suggestion would be to avoid any of that avoid stretching um that achilles because it needs some time to just repair itself so yes non-impact is good you could probably get away with swimming but watch out kicking off the wall too much because that is a kind of it can be an explosive jumping force where you flatten out you know your feet on the wall and you bend your knees so that's going to stretch your achilles you know uh so avoid that um I would also avoid elliptical because if you're doing an elliptical, you can sometimes that back leg rotation can get a little Achilles stretch as well. Uh, but you can bike, you could row. Um, like I said, swim, but be careful with the kickoffs. But yeah, that's what I would do. I probably safest thing I would do is probably bike. And then you're going to feel like stretching it thinking it's going to feel better when you do just avoid stretching if you're going to do anything put compression on it like a compression sleeve or do some foam rolling uh massaging but try to avoid stretching it b 
because uh, that's probably how you injured it. And I'm just guessing with that. So correct me if I'm wrong on how you injured it. If it's just a, you know, overuse injury, it's probably from the same thing, just overstretching somehow. Maybe you have a lot of hills to run up or, you know, you do some jumping and things like that, sprinting. You know, those things can slowly aggravate it if it doesn't immediately aggravate it. And believe me, you'll know when you immediately aggravate it. So there you go. Good question. Hey, what's a good time for your 50-50 workout? I'm doing it in 16 minutes. Uh, I'm assuming that's 10 sets of 50-50s. That's good. I mean, it's only 1,000 yards. So if you can do 1,000 yards in 16 minutes, I think that's great. You know, that's excellent. Now, I usually have a 500 warm-up or a 500 cool-down added to that. So, you know, it should, you know, with the warm-ups or cool-downs, it should take you you know, 24, 25 minutes, maybe total. Um, but yeah, 10 sets of a 50, 50 and 16. I would say personally, if you can do that, um, change it up a little bit and now try five hundred hundreds. Same distance, just bigger sets. So you're doubling up a little bit. That's going to challenge you a little bit. But, you know, if you're doing a thousand in 16 minutes, you're getting in shape to be able to do a 500 in eight minutes. And that is the key, right? So I'd be very surprised if the next 500 um, CSS that you do is not somewhere in that eight minute range. If it's not, then it, it could be a technique issue because it looks like your swimming conditioning is there. Um, if you're not in, in your freestyle, maybe faster than your CSS. So that may be the only issue. If you're not swimming 815, 8 flat, um, send me a video. We'll fix that, you know, whatever uh, technique issue you're having. And we can go from there. Well, my uh, my computer seems to be working again. That's good. Um, this. Let me see. We got another question. Nail on the head from sprinting and running. Okay. Um, yeah. Try not to stretch it. That's going to be the hardest thing. Massage, foam roll. Um, yeah, compression. That's probably going to be the best thing for you. Throw some heat on there if you wanted to. Um, if you got swelling, you know, ibuprofen. 50, 50 freestyle and 50 CSS. Yes. I'm not sure what question that is, but that is the 50 50 workout. In fact, if you want to see the 50 50 workout, all you got to do is Google it. Um, in fact, here it is. This is an article I wrote. It's called the 50 50 workout crushed the swim test in less than a month. No kidding, man. I have literally seen people come in to our training cycle training cycles and you know come in at like 10 minutes swim and they're at eight minutes the fastest i've ever seen by anybody go from eight minutes to you know 10 minutes to eight minutes is about three weeks but you know he did five days a week of swimming so that's only i mean think about the investment that is that's 15 workouts that's all you have to do and the next thing you know you just drop a minute and a half two minutes off your swim I mean, that's now that was the best I've ever seen. All results may not be similar, but, you know, it was it was impressive. All right. So let me share this. I think this is one of those swims that you might be able to learn something by not doing this. Or maybe it is what you're doing wrong. So let me see what happened here. Do you do two pullouts? One pull out, two pull out. Yeah, don't do that, right? So this isn't an underwater swim. So, and two pull outs, like, first of all, he kicks off the wall, not very streamlined, and he immediately goes into a pull out. You don't need to do that, right? You can kick off this wall and at least get 
two body lengths off the wall before you start this pull out. He's about a foot and a half off the wall before he starts pulling water. Um, so don't do two, just do one. Give yourself a little more glide time. All right, so he makes a decent transition into the, uh, the stroke part. Didn't lose a lot of momentum there. However, his stroke causes him to lose momentum a little bit. Not sure why that is yet. So top arm, bottom arm, kick. He's got a breaststroke kick here that actually looks pretty good. He seems to be swimming a little bit diagonal versus, uh, you know, trying to stay flat in the water. I think his head's up a little too high. So almost treating it like a breaststroke. Now you see how he just plowed the surface of the water like that. Like that is like swimming with the brakes on. Like, you don't want to do that. You want to be underwater. Like, that was a loss of all momentum. And then did you notice he only did one pull out this time? You know why? Because he's winded. And he can't maintain two pull outs every stroke. You're just not going to do it. So just do one. A lot of people skip one because that's hard. And they go right into the stroke as well. All right. So we got top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. Good breaststroke. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. Nope. He's pulling a little bit too soon. He's got uh, really big, like notice the uh, arm recovery. Like everything's way away from his body. You know, that needs to be a lot tighter. Like his hands and forearms should be scraping his chest and his belly as he goes up into that glide position. But he's, he's, a, he's swimming out here, right? That's just going to, it's just like, once again, putting the brakes on when you swim. One step forward, one step back. Maybe two steps forward, one step back. Top arm, bottom arm. He keeps his head down there. So it looks this looks better coming back. Looks a little flatter. I personally don't like the breaststroke kick. And I know this guy's not a competitive swimmer. So I don't think his breaststroke kick is strong enough to really produce the same type of power that maybe a scissor kick could produce. Um, but yeah, not bad overall, Joe, that's a good question. There you go. What's my favorite program I've ever made? Hmm. I've made a lot. Like I have made, I have 13 published books. Um, I have over 40 self-published programs. I will have to say that one of my favorites to make and create, I just saw it in here, where was it? Um, one of my favorites to make was this one. This is a published book, 101 Best Pyramid Training Workouts. You can find it up on Amazon. I do have an app for it on my site that's pretty good um but it's it's basically a hundred plus um pyramid workouts every every page is a, is an individual workout and uh it's just fun just fun i love pyramids in fact i did a pyramid today we did a calisthenics up pull up push-ups dips and sit-ups pull-ups push-ups sit-ups and dips calisthenics up with a run every set 400 meter run every set for 10 and then on the way down we put a weight vest on didn't do sit-ups with the weight vest we just did um uh weight vest pull-ups you know nine to one uh push-ups times two and dips times one uh but for the abs, what we did is every time you were in the push-up position, you had to stay there for 30 seconds every set uh, at the end of your push-up numbers that set. So if you were at uh, nine, you had to do 18 push-ups. So you did 18 push-ups and just stayed in the leading rest for 30 seconds. So by the end of that, you had about four and a half minutes in the leaning rest along with you know the rest of your pull-ups and push-ups and stuff. So... I've always enjoyed pyramids. I think that one was probably the most fun pyramid I had. In fact, when the, my publisher said, hey, you should consider 
right in a pyramid because a lot of your workouts have this pyramid in it. And I'm like, oh man, I could do that. You know, so it, it made me, I had like 50 already. So 50 of those workouts were already done, but I had to create 50 more. Uh, and it was just fun. Uh, it was fun to do that. I will say this, uh, one of my favorite ones that are like spec war, um, related is, uh, is this one. Um, I don't know if you can see that. No, I can't see that yet. Damn it. Let me see if I can share it. Spec war related. Uh, Air Force Special Warfare, crush the IFT, OFT. I just updated this one because Air Force Special Warfare changed their PT test from the past test to the IFT, but they also added the OFT. And it makes sense. You know, you have an operator fitness test and you have a pass test. So that pass test, they just changed the name and made it the initial fitness test. A lot of common sense changes going on over there at uh, Air Force Special Warfare. So I just updated this this one, and, and it actually has a program not only to crush the IFT, but also crush the OFT. It's like an additional four weeks, so it's like a 16-week program now. And then, you know, there's all these supplemental programs and not supplemental. There are these additional workouts in there that are not PST related, but they're definitely, you're going to see them in the selection. A lot of treading, a lot of drown proofing, you know, all those little skills like that. So that, that was a fun one to make as well. And it's by far probably one of my favorites. Yeah. I, I like my Navy SEAL ones too, and my Marine Corps ones and FBI is a, a, a good one as well. But those two were just a lot of fun to make and i see a lot of results in them like a lot of even my old timers you know that have been with me for over 20 years they're now in their 40s you know they grew up on my pt pyramids when they were in their teenage years and um so that they enjoyed you know still doing a lot of pt pyramids so there you go joe that was an excellent question i give you credit when you ask good questions so good job. I ship out to basic for recon contract in six weeks. Just got done recovering from shin splints. Woo. What should my running program look like until basic? Man, that's tough. Um, I would progress gently. You know, don't go back into running like what gave you shin splints. Um, I would get some new shoes for sure because that probably added to the reason why you had shin splints um check out your form don't run too much work on your pace you know you're a marine so you know you're gonna have to crush the uh three mile time to run so it's not going to be low mileage for you marine corps boot camp is no joke you're gonna be running and rucking gonna be running in boots rucking in boots You'd be ready to run and choose too, but I mean, be able to stretch your shins and, you know, sometimes tight ankles. That's another reason why mobility, I don't know if you were listening at the beginning of this, but that's another reason why mobility is really important, especially that ankle stretching uh, portion is because a lot of times tight ankles add to getting shin splints and other foot related injuries too. So work on those mobility stretches on your ankles, but run progressively. So I would say whatever you were doing before you got shin splints, that mileage per week, I would probably cut that in half and work back into running, maybe even run every other day but you got to do some hard non-impact cardio too, just to keep the cardio up, you know, the cardio ability, endurance up. It can be biking, it can be elliptical, it can be swimming or rowing, but get your heart rate up to the, like the same effort that it requires you to run a fast three mile timed run. You should be 
biking or rowing for 20, 25 minutes hard and get your heart rate up the same heart rate it, it would be when you're doing a running event for that distance and time. Otherwise, if you're just taking a ride in the park, not even breathing hard, you know, what are you doing, right? So the effort has to match. If you're going to do non-impact cardio, the effort of your non-impact cardio has to match the effort of your running for it to be effective, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. I may have one more video. I think I had four videos to share. I just had some technical difficulties while I was sharing it. I think, I think this is it. So let's do this. We'll do one more of these and then I will call it quits for the day. All right. So we got to kick off the wall. All right. Kick off the wall and little, okay. That's a little awkward dog. I don't know what that is. Um, so this dolphin kick here is really kind of useless. I mean, it's, you, you got to get a lot more limber in your, uh, thoracic lumbar region. And it's, it really starts in your hips and whips down to your knees. Now you got your knees bent here pretty well. Let's see how hard they, they go down. That's not bad. So you got a good knee whip out of it, but the part all up here is really tight and just do one dolphin kick off the wall. If you're going to try it, don't do two or three or whatever that was. And there, you know, there's another one where, you know, that, that should probably be as you transition into your stroke, instead of doing whatever that was to try a, either a breaststroke kick or a scissor kick going into the stroke. Otherwise you're going to lose a lot of momentum. And you notice that watch what happened. Like you kind of lost some momentum there. Then another reason why you lost momentum, look, look how high your head pops up, right? So when your head pops up like that, you're just, you're basically swimming vertical now and you quit swimming horizontal. So you want to turn to breathe like a screwdriver, not pop up to breathe like that and lose all of your horizontal movement and you go right into a vertical movement. Right. If you notice, like you go up and almost backwards, right, when you do that. So you don't want to do that. So, yeah, like every stroke, you, you move forward, then you stop and you go up. You move forward, you pull, you stop, you go up. Right. Got a decent glide, though. Give you that. Let's see how this kickoff, that turnaround was way too slow. Yeah. Lay off those dolphin kicks. I don't think they're helpful. I think they're a waste of energy for you right now because you're not really doing them well. Once again, head pops up. But I will say this. The timing is good. Top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. One Mississippi, two Mississippi pull. I think you might be over gliding because I got, I got into that late. Let's see how this looks. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. Five. Yeah, that's way too long. So that that's another reason why you're losing momentum every stroke. Like you're stopping when you go vertical and then you're stopping again when you glide. So that's a lot of loss of momentum during this stroke that if you just pull on three, like if you were to go one Mississippi, two Mississippi pull, like you would, you wouldn't lose any momentum. So that's why we go to that three Mississippi pull thing. All right. A couple more questions. Let me stop sharing here. I uh, really struggle with over-unders, especially in camis. Does that get better over time? Yes, you need to practice those, though. Here's the problem with over-unders with camis, is you have no glide. Like, there's not a whole lot of glide time that you can create when you got all that drag. So it's almost best not to even try to glide like you know there's going to be a habit of like if you got any glide it'd be right here like after you do that double arm pull you might get a little bit of glide but when you kick and recover you're not going to go very far and you're going to really need to pull focus on your breaststroke pull out more than the kick 
because the kick is pretty much useless when you're trying to recover your arms and glide. It's just, it doesn't do very well. Sometimes you might get a yard out of it, but it's, it's pretty exhausting. So maybe not put a whole lot of effort in your kick, but put more effort into your arms. Think about what's going to use less oxygen, right? Using your arms, pulling and holding that glide for a second or two is going to use a lot less oxygen than kicking those big muscles of your legs and butt, you know, more often. And if you're trying to flutter kick, forget it. You know, don't even think about trying to flutter kick under there because that's just going to really tire you out. Now, if you have fins on, different story. You can do over-unders with fins on, that's a completely different animal because that's that's how you're going to propel better. But you can still get in some good lower oxygen use pulls with your arm versus a lot of kicking. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, Dylan? What are your thoughts on CrossFit type of lifts? I do a lot of assault bike rowers to get heart rate up with doing calisthenics. I have, I have no problem with CrossFit type lifts. I mean, they're basically Olympic lifts, right? Kettlebells and Olympic lifts. Sandbags, medicine balls. Yep. Don't have a problem with it. What I have a problem with is turning a lift into an endurance exercise, right? I, I think, you know, coming from a powerlifting background, you know, I have never done a workout where I accumulated a hundred deadlifts in a workout or a hundred power cleans, right? You know, maybe 25 max, five sets of five, that's about it. Um, and that's hard if you're going heavy. So I, I find that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of high repetition lifts like that, um, are, if you're doing them properly, they can be very useful for getting your heart rate up for sure. And they're really no different than high rep calisthenics if you're going light and you're doing good form. But, you know, you start playing around with heavier weight towards the end when you're form shot, then that's when people get hurt. So I don't have a problem with CrossFit. I don't do it, but I don't have a problem with it. I think it's done more good for the fitness industry than than harm, you know, and it gets people out there moving and I'm all for that. Let's see. What are your thoughts on the total duration of workouts for the week? What would be a good number to shoot for? What will be too much? Great question, Victor. I hope you're doing well. Um, lost my uh, focus there. There you go. Um, well, I will say this. This will be the last question. Um, I need to go. Um, I will say this. It, it really depends. I mean, you can do as little as 30 minutes a day, five, six days a week. So what are you looking at? Two and a half, three hours? Or you can do an hour a day and be somewhere in that five to six hours a week. Um, I think those are very logical. I think if you're starting to push into the 90 to two hours a day or three hours a day, then you have to really adjust your sleep has to be perfect. Your nutrition has to be perfect um, just for pure recovery things because uh, it, you know, it's hard on you. I will say this. I usually get in about 10 to 12 hours of working out a week. So I basically get about two hours a day. Um, and some days I'll get another half hour, 45 minutes of swimming three to four days a week. So that adds in another, but I, I really kind of count swimming as part of my recovery because it's, it's not that hard. Every now and then I'll throw some hypoxics in there and get winded. But for the most part, I feel better when I swim because it just loosens everything up more than anything. So I, I kind of treat that kind of like a, almost like a mobility session versus an athletic high output energy session. So, um, 
I think if you, you do you do as little as thirty minutes a day and crush those thirty minutes, you can get an effective weekly workout cycle. So it doesn't have to be two, three hours long. I personally have the philosophy is th- of this. I train a lot of people who are preparing for selections, boot camps, academies, and those last all day long and sometimes many hours into the night. So you almost have to prepare yourself for the long events of the day. And it doesn't have to be all working out. I recommend my guys, if they really want to prepare themselves for like a spec ops selection, then they come in and before work, they do an hour, hour and a half worth of work. They go to work all day, stay on their feet, manual labor stuff, you know, just staying awake, moving, constantly doing stuff, having to hydrate and eat, you know, for just pure performance and recovery. Um, And then somewhere, maybe lunch or after work, they get another, you know, cool down workout in or something like that. Uh, Maybe go for a swim or something. That is a great way to prepare for those spec ops jobs. However, if you're just trying to stay healthy, you don't have to do that level of time commitment to your day. I remember when I when I went to Bud's, and this is going to sound funny, but you know I was at the Naval Academy working hard. You know my days were long. You know I'd work out before school, um, and then I'd go to class all day. I try to squeeze in a swim somewhere either before rugby practice or after rugby practice. Then I would study all night to almost midnight, wake back up before six, do another workout. You know, so it was just so I remember going to Bud's thinking, holy crap, my day's done. It's 530. Yeah, I'm about to go eat dinner. I don't have homework to do. I don't have to go do a workout. You know, I'm I just got to get ready for tomorrow. I said, this is awesome. Um, So that is why I like to stay busy during your life prior to these type of service jobs, just because it's going to prepare you for the grind. That is what spec ops training day is. You know, I tell people all the time, there's no 30 minute workout in the gym. That's going to prepare you for a day of spec ops training, right? Your day is going to prepare you for spec ops training. So great question, Victor. I appreciate it. So last comment here, uh, thanks to my dad turned me on to your channel years ago to improve my combat side stroke. I appreciate you. Well, that's a good job, Jim. Thank you very much, James. Um, good luck to you with what you're trying to do. All right, folks, I'm done. I will catch you guys next week. Uh, if you got some videos you want to send me, send them. Happy to uh, check them out. You want to watch some videos, um, check out uh, my TikTok page. Stu Smith five zero also on my Instagram page as well. Give that a follow because I post uh, new videos all the time over there. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it until next time. I appreciate it. You guys have a good day.